So folks know we have a catalog of all of our CTIP CAN calls on our website that we always put up there. Um, CTIP's been sort of running into more and more high gear. Uh, you know, we're starting to hit our stride. We, we hired staff six months ago, which is kind of hard to join Jen uh, and, and a few others join the team six months ago. And, you know, in a lot of ways, CTIP's been on a growth journey. Um, as an organization, as we started to develop a uh, funding stream, are still working towards sustainable funding. But as we hit more of our stride, we're doing more and more work in the policy um, and practice arena. Um, and so just so folks sort of know, we sort of took a, as an organization, a, a, a more of a shotgun approach to see all of the different areas that we could work on. Um, and to show, you know, members of Congress, uh, our advocates, our network all across the country, the broad application that a trauma-informed lens has um, on policy and practice. And now we're starting to enter into more of a strategic planning process. So we're really excited as an organization for where we are going and making a deeper impact in a few strategic areas that will hopefully allow for us to have leverage moving forward to have more and more of an impact in a broad field to move the entire country. Hopefully someday we grow and it's the whole world forward. Um, you know, we talk about not just a trauma informed lens, but I talk about a community led trauma informed prevention oriented resilience focused and healing centered lens that we want to create um, a space where we can coordinate and advance the entire movement bring people together from different paradigms to work toward this upstream as well as downstream, uh, you know, trauma-informed care and prevention lens to improve people's experiences overall and reduce the burdens of negative health outcomes, tax burdens on our society as a whole. This has so many different uh, iterations and ways that that shows up in the world. And so as a small team, we're trying to focus um, more and more where we can make a deep impact today that, again, gives us leverage as a movement to make more and more of an impact moving forward. Um, so just wanted to say that as an introduction, as we enter into this strategic planning process, we may reach out to all of you at, um, at some point to get sort of your input on what CTIP's done well, where we have room for growth because we want for it to be um, oriented around that community-led piece, right? All of your lived experiences and expertise that you bring, we want to be able to leverage as we grow. Uh, we may not be able to do everything at once, but we want that feedback and input to continue to inform our journey forward. So I just wanted to share that. But without uh, me rambling on anymore for now at least, I want to pass it over to our wonderful Director of Government Affairs, Jen Kurt to go over a DC update, a few exciting developments, as well as introduce our education report um, that was just recently released. So Jen, I turn it over to you. Thank you, Jesse. Hey everyone, I'm Jen. I am CTIP's Director of Government Affairs. It's good to see some familiar faces and welcome if this is your first CTIP CAN call. So happy to have you here to help us advocate. Um, we are going to spend, I'm going to give some quick updates on what's happening um, in Congress right now, and then we are going to spend until about 2.45 talking about trauma-informed schools. It is back to school season, and we are getting a lot of work done on that, educating around that issue, and we want to make sure that you're all uh, brought into the fold on that because we could use all the help um, that our advocates can offer uh, to really raise awareness for that. Um, the House, the U.S. House of Representatives and the U.S. Senate came back last week after August recess. We have um, just seven more weeks until the midterm elections. The midterm elections are November 8th. After the midterm elections, we will enter into what people call the lame duck session. So that means that there are many members of Congress in the, in the House and the Senate who have lost their election or who have decided not to run. And so a lot of that leads to inaction um, because we're just ramping down the end of the season. It's just naturally, 
you know, a lot of transition and not a lot of movement happening. But at the same time as that's happening, Congress has a lot of deadlines approaching for bills they need to pass, uh, programs they need to reauthorize, funding they need to allocate to avoid programs shutting down, the government shutting down, the military shutting down. And so we're at an interesting time over the next uh, couple of months where, um, you know, in October, members of Congress are campaigning for their uh, for election day, then election day after that until no November 8th until January. Uh, we're in a kind of a, of a dead period, and yet there's so much to do. So it was a really interesting time um, in Washington, D.C. And a couple deadlines that are really relevant to um, CTIP and our work on trauma um, are coming up on September 30th. So that's next Friday. Um, the first thing is that the um, annual appropriations, so the, the legislation that funds the entire federal government and all of the agencies and all of the uh, grant programs that trickle down to states and locals and all the nonprofits and community-based organizations, if Congress doesn't pass a bill to extend uh, the, the budget by next Friday, the government shuts down all of those programs shut down. And they're very far from reaching a compromise on a, on a new fiscal year 2023 bill. So what it looks like they're gonna do is pass a continuing resolution or a CR, which just extends last year's funding level for a little bit longer. So they're still trying to reach a compromise on how long they're gonna extend it for. It looks like mid-December to get us past that election. Um, and they're still arguing over what they're gonna tack on to that CR. So the Biden administration has asked for additional money for Ukraine, COVID-19, certain disaster stricken areas like in Kentucky and Texas. Um, and so there's some you know, classic congressional dysfunction as they're trying to negotiate right up until the deadline what's going to go into that CR, um, but we are hoping that we're going to avoid a government shutdown and both chambers will pass that bill next week. But like a lot of things, you know, they're getting down to the uh, final arguments right at the last moment. Um, so it's an exciting uh, but nerve wracking time. And then the other thing that CTIP and our advocates have been tracking is um, a program called uh, MICV, which is the Maternal Infant Early Childhood Home Visiting Program. Um, so this has been shown to help parents break cycles of trauma and poverty by providing support and teaching skills that help families achieve financial stability and help them to parent children. Um, so this program is, is really helpful in reducing maternal mortality, preterm birth, um, and reducing the um, uh, child protective services, referrals, and things like that. This program is reauthorized every five years, and its reauthorization ends September 30th. So again, if Congress doesn't pass a reauthorization for the McV program, um, that is uh, going to be suspended, and we're not going to have any more money for those programs. And so um, CTIP is working with um, a coalition to urge Congress to reauthorize um, McV. And either they're gonna put that in the CR or they'll pass a standalone, um, but we're really fighting by any means necessary to make sure that that program doesn't, doesn't lapse. Um, and as Jesse put in the chat, these updates are also included in a monthly newsletter that I, um, I write for CTIP um, on Washington DC updates. And so he put that in the chat. But I wanted to switch gears a little bit into um, something that is a little bit less um, triggering in terms of deadlines um, and uh, dysfunction in Congress and just talk about the work that we've been doing to support trauma-informed schools. And so I'm gonna share my screen in a moment and share this report and, and spend a little bit of time um, walking you through the report. But just for some context, in the conversations that we've been having with uh, federal agencies and with um, Congress members and congressional staff, when we talk about trauma-informed transformation, sometimes we get dead eye stares. Um, and we noticed that that to be true when we talked about trauma-informed schools. There was sort of a misunderstanding where I think a lot of people's understanding of what a trauma-informed school was is having a school-based mental health counselor who understands trauma. But what we really mean is a transformation that takes place school-wide, 
where policies on uh, school discipline are changed, practices on interactions between two students and teachers are changed, and um, every member of the community is engaged um, and bought in. And so we created just a short report um, that we've been able to send out to the Department of Education, to um, congressional staff and offices to make sure they're reading it, to make sure that um, they're educating themselves on um, what we really mean when we talk about trauma-informed schools. It's a really important first step because in the work that we do, we think everyone kind of understands what we're talking about here, but the reality is there is a lack of grasp of what we're, what we're really talking about. So we wanted to just give um, a preview through this report. Um, so I'll walk through that and then we're gonna have um, a legislative counsel from Congresswoman Catherine Clark's um, office come in and talk about um, her bill um, for trauma-informed schools. I think it's called the Trauma-Informed Schools Act. Um, and then we're gonna take five minutes before our break where if you're interested, we're gonna do a live call to action together We've put together an email template that we can copy and paste and send to our members of Congress that just makes them aware of the report, make sure that they're reading it, gives a little bit more context. Um, so if you're interested, we will spend five minutes doing that before our break. Let me just share my screen and I can, um, you know, walk us through that PDF. Um, it's nine pages, uh, including the cover and the, and the closed pages. It's not too long. Um, and can everyone, Jesse, can you see this? Thumbs up. Great, okay, awesome. Um, and I'm going to slideshow mode. Awesome. So, um, come on, PBF. All right, so we have a foreword here by uh, Jim Sporletter. Many of you may be familiar with him. He was the former principal of Lincoln High School in Washington State where he uh, led the um, transformation across his school and saw really incredible results. And there was a documentary about his school. Um, so he you know, sort of makes the case in his own words in our forward here. And then if we have our, in, in, sorry. Are you zoomed in? We're getting about three quarters to 80% of the page. Okay, let me escape presentation mode. Yeah, Is sorry. Is it better like this? Yeah. Okay, great. Okay, I'll just leave it like this then, no problem. Um, allows me to scroll a little bit more. Um, so in the introduction, we explained them to exactly the context I just, I just broke down. So trauma happens for students sometimes in school, but a lot of the times outside of schools, in their families, in their communities, through other institutions that do harm. And schools create, create a really great um, opportunity to provide that support to children, to their families, and to uh, people who work at the school. So it's a great point of intervention to facilitate um, this work around preventing and addressing trauma. Uh, but currently the education system, uh, while they could fill that role, they're just not given the support and the tools and the resources to promote that, those healthy, positive relationships and current common uh, school policies and practices don't really reflect the reality of brain development that will help students um, who are experiencing trauma or students generally to really um, have healthy brain development. Um, and so we really wanted to highlight in this report that there is a growing movement in schools nationwide to become trauma-informed. And later in this report, we highlight two great examples of schools that are doing exactly that. We wanted to explain the pervasiveness of trauma for those who weren't familiar. I know, you know, we are, um, but more than two thirds of children report at least one traumatic experience by the age of 16. That's a huge number. Um, and experiencing that trauma, of course, can impact healthy development without that proper support. The complex trauma can lead to changes in the brain that will impact physical and mental health throughout the lifespan and impact one's ability to create relationships and to um, have healthy behaviors. So some examples of those experiences we listed right here. So that's poverty and hunger. Maybe it's an acute instance like a natural disaster or an act of terrorism, community violence, or it could be um, abuse or neglect in the home, 
the loss of a loved one. We know that a lot of students have experienced the loss of a loved one due to the pandemic, whether it's a grandparent or a parent. So that's, that's very, very relevant here. And then we wanted to give co uh, concrete examples of how that trauma manifests in the classroom. So often when students or young people experience trauma, they may react through hyperarousal or intrusion or constriction. So what does that mean in the classroom? Maybe if they're hyperarousal, that's exhaustion, being easily overwhelmed, unable to concentrate, jittery, paranoid, general irritability, intrusion, that means maybe outsized reactions to things, emotional distress, outbursts, constrictions, perhaps a student is shut down or avoidant, maybe they appear uninterested or unengaged or underperform. And as we know too often, these um, behaviors are labeled as disruptive. And you know, maybe those students encounter disciplinary measures uh, as a result, or they struggle to complete assignments um, and they're kind of left behind. Um, maybe they have trouble with their language skills and are wrongfully referred to special education programs. So we felt this was really important to highlight because these are things that are happening. And when teachers, when educators, when administrators don't have that context of why students are behaving this way or the examples of what to do, what is a compassionate response, it ends in suspension, expulsion, discipline, ostracization, you know, further re-traumatization. And that's exactly why the status quo, you know, isn't working. So these antiquated practices that are being used, like behavior charts, public discipline, which is embarrassing, um, punishment, you know, placing a heavy emphasis on attendance, um, you know, those re-traumatized students, they can exacerbate those trauma response, they can worsen symptoms, um, you know, and really there is a solution, but um, it's not being practiced. And so in this page, we lay out exactly what we mean, what, how we would define trauma-informed schools. They, these policies work, they've been shown to reduce behavioral referrals, reduce expulsions, reduce suspensions, increase teacher retention, increase test scores. Um, and so what we really mean by trauma-informed schools is a, the whole school environment, the culture and conditions of healing and by engaging every school community member. And um, that may look different for every school. It's individualized, but it's not a specific program or curriculum. It's an ongoing process. And so this trauma-informed transformation can include ongoing professional development and training for the staff, as well as new policies and practices that support the implementation of lessons learned throughout the whole school. And it engages members of the trauma-informed community, which is not just students and teachers, but is also administrators, parents, caregivers, counselors, custodians, bus drivers, cafeteria workers, and they all have to receive training and understand the impact of trauma on the human mind, body, and spirit. And then they need to be given skills to practice thoughtful and intentional kindness and show authentic care for others in structured and measurable ways so that they can respond to unwanted behavior in a way that teaches self-awareness and seeks solutions to remove barriers to support, to provide people with support when they're exhibiting these kinds of behaviors and experiencing trauma. You know, so um, we wanted, we highlighted in this last paragraph that of course, transforming schools into trauma-informed environment is not the full solution to our trauma problem. Because trauma happens outside the school, we also need other institutions to transform into trauma-informed institutions. But the school is a really great point of intervention because um, it reaches so many members of the community. So that's a good place um, for us to, to point to. And then I wanted to touch upon our, our great examples. So in Hawaii, they you know, wanted to go through this trauma-informed transfer transformation because they had this school to prison pipeline problem. And there was high suspensions and students just didn't have positive career prospects. So what they did was they trained faculty, staff, parents and other partners in trauma aware and trauma skilled trainings. They trained them to see behaviors as resulting from trauma and intergenerational poverty that could be reversed. 
So they had this training and workshops in restorative practices, de-escalation, self-care, restraint and security in a compassionate way, youth mental health first aid, and trauma-informed practices. So they shifted the school policies from disciplinary to relationship-oriented and from exclusionary to inclusionary. And what they saw was that suspensions decreased 33%. And for overall, and suspensions for students with disabilities decreased 24%. And um, then in Texas, at the John T. White Elementary School, they had a problem with failing state exams. They had never passed a state exam. Um, constant, what they would describe as behavioral explosions in the classroom, high class removal and walkout rate. 76% um, of students reported trauma. Um, and what they did, which is really incredible, um, the first five days of the school year, they focused on um, teaching emotional regulation activities and relationship building. The teachers and staff had a full day of training by specialists with several refresher training sessions throughout the year. They had also weekly email uh, with emails sent to them with relevant tips. And then for the students, these practices were put in place where each day um, students are greeted by at least five adults. This creates a welcoming atmosphere. They then participate in a morning circle to build connection um, and practice self-regulation. The school offers free water and snacks, calm spaces in the classroom, a wellness room, physical activity and movement breaks built throughout the day. And then teachers are encouraged not to remove recess as a punishment. And they have self-regulation posters in the hallways. Rather than traditional discipline methods, they teach students what they could have done differently. So they practice redos and apologies and reinforce self-regulation. They use suspension as an absolute last resort. And what they saw was decreased suspensions from an average of 40, 445 suspensions a year to 19. The school passed its state exams for the first time, teacher retention dramatically increased and the school culture became calmer. So these are two examples of practices that we wanted to elevate to policymakers to give them a really good understanding of what exactly it takes to become trauma-informed. And then here in the transformation element, we just distilled what are those takeaways? What are those themes that we look for when we wanna consider something a trauma-informed school? So really the first one, that commitment must be modeled from the top down. So those school leadership have to prioritize the trauma-informed model. School staff all have to have a baseline level of training and take, take part in these process conversations so they really understand the impact of trauma and reflect about you know, what's working and what needs improvement. Um, the school has to value relationship development and maintenance, um, you know, not just with students, but also students caregivers and other community stakeholders. And then uh, finally, school personnel needs to genuinely believe and view behavior as an adapt adaptation, adaptive way of communicating their unmet met needs rather than an act of defiance. It's really a shift in understanding you know, why, the why of behaviors. So that's our report. I'll turn it over to Jesse. Jesse wanted to provide some additional context of, you know, the significance. Um, so I'll, I'll stop sharing my screen and turn it over to you, Jesse, for the next five. Yeah, Jen, thank you. Um, and thanks for sharing the report. Also just want to give appropriate shout out to Peyton Barcel, who wanted to be here today, had something pop up um, as a student at Columbia. Uh, be, being students is always difficult, uh, so I know that she wanted to be here, uh, but Jen and Peyton worked really hard on this report. Um, my master's is in educational leadership, so this topic is very important to me. Again, we want to work across all sectors. Schools cannot do this alone, and we highlight this in the report. We need full community efforts and other places to be engaged. But education is a place that we can reach nearly every student, every child, in this country and so reform within the education system is very 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 palatable we will um, hear more i know about specific practices from dr felice and uh, rob in a bit um, about how you know this can be implemented in schools but i just wanted to share quickly uh, before we hear from our friend from uh, rep uh, representative clark's office uh, a specific two specific examples or um, you know for me personally um, I, I struggled in school at times. I know that I've shared it before, but my best friend uh, passed away when I was 15. And one of the reasons that a full school 
environmental shift is so important and this can't just be on the counselors is because being in school when I lost my friend between freshman and sophomore years of high school was itself re-traumatizing every time I went back to school because that's where the majority of Doug and my relationship was. And so there was a lot of outbursts when I was a student and I struggled academically and it was the support of coaches and teachers and friends throughout the following years while I completed high school that helped me get through. So it wasn't just a function of eject and reject that model that we see too much in our education system where, you know, go to the guidance counselor. It's no, like we just need to help develop relationships at times. At times there is a time for a specialist to come in and provide support. But at other times, we just need to be able to provide relationships with the student where they are and not further um, ostracize them or make them feel other than, but bring them in and help, help them feel as part of a community of support, as well as learn some of those self-regulation, self-care tactics. So it's both self-care and community care. And while that's a part of my story, I, I also worked in a Philadelphia public high school and I realized how much more adversity with fewer supports there were in that school system. And so to recognize how much I struggled, how much support I needed, and then how much more we are having students that are not reaching their full potential and that trauma-informed education could help us create better cycles of support and help more students reach that full potential is really, really important. That was my intro into the trauma-informed movement. Again, now it's expanded, recognizing that schools cannot do it alone. And also that it's not just about students, but also providing support for staff and administrators and other members of the school environment. So that way it's healthier for everybody. In addition to the improved outcomes for students that Jen highlighted, we've also seen how the staff uh, turnover reduces as well because the school becomes a healthier environment overall. Uh, Jen, I don't know if our friend is on yet, but just one more piece that I want to share really quickly and acknowledge is what this report is and is not, which I know Jen already touched upon, but this report is a great advocacy tool. It discusses at a very high level the importance of trauma-informed education, some key principles without um, going into you know, it is not an implementation guide, right? There are other pieces that do that, and that is just not CTIP's space. And so we recognize that even in the school environment, it can help with advocacy to say trauma-informed education is very important, but we don't want for this to be used as an implementation guide. We are model neutral. There are other places that do that in greater depth that is necessary to implement in schools, but this can be used for advocacy and to raise awareness at various levels. And so that's why we created this report. We'll continue to create reports for other sector service systems as well as time moves on. Um, Jen, I think that I just saw Ashley hop on. And so perfect timing. I will turn it back over to Jen to discuss the Trauma-Informed Schools Act and I'll go back on mute. Awesome, thank you so much, Jesse. Um, so I'm excited to introduce Ashley. Ashley, we just finished giving a preview of the report that we just published. Um, we're excited to hear a little bit more from you. Um, so Ashley is legislative counsel for Congresswoman uh, Catherine Clark. Congresswoman Catherine Clark um, represents Massachusetts fifth congressional district, and she serves an important role in leadership for Democrats. Catherine Clark is the assistant speaker for the US House of Representatives which means she is in an important leadership role and having her as an ally uh, on the trauma-informed movement and in trauma-informed schools is so exciting. And, and she's great at building bridges, working across the aisle on issues like this bill. So Ashley handles uh, her education policy among some other issues. Um, they just reintroduced the Trauma-Informed Schools Act. So I will pass over to Ashley to share more about that bill um, and anything else you wanna share um, on your boss's great work on this issue. And we will have, uh, we may have some time for Q&A if anyone has questions for Ashley after she speaks. Over to you. Great. Well, thank you, Jen. Um, as Jen mentioned, I'm Ashley and I work on education policy for assistant speaker, Catherine Clark. Um, 
excited to be here today with you all and have the chance to chat about my boss's work on trauma-informed schools and how to best support students. So um, empowering students and educators and supporting trauma-informed learning environments has long been a priority of Congresswoman Clark's both before her congressional career and it's a big reason as to why she is here in Congress today. And with that, the Congresswoman introduced the Trauma-Informed Schools Act back in July to ensure that key federal funding sources like Title I, Title II, the Student Support and Academic Enrichment Grants and 21st Century Community Learning Center funding are available to support the implementation of trauma-informed care in school settings. Um, this bill doesn't contain any new funding, but it works to clarify in federal law that the implementation of trauma-informed practices in education are an allowable use of federal funding, and it requires states to include in their applications for federal funding how they're going to use that money to support trauma-informed care. Um, notably, the bill also defines trauma-informed practices for the first time in federal education law, which helps ensure that these practices are evidence-based and um, meet the needs of all students. So this bill comes at a time where there is a very acute focus here in Congress um, that students and educators need support especially as we work to address the impacts of the pandemic and other challenges that students are facing today. Um, Congresswoman Clark sits on the House Appropriations Committee, including the Labor, HHS, and Education Subcommittee. And um, we were excited that the subcommittee held a hearing earlier this spring on social emotional learning and whole child approaches in K-12 education. We're also very excited that the fiscal year 23 bill for the Department of Education, which the, the Appropriations Committee advanced back in June, includes robust funding for social and emotional learning initiative. And that'll help support teacher professional development when it comes to social and emotional learning, and it'll help increase um, health and child development experts in schools. I'll also flag that just yesterday, um, the Education and Labor Subcommittee held a hearing on meeting students' academic, social, and emotional needs as they head back to school this fall. So all that to say, there are several paths by which Congress is exploring and working to advance trauma-informed um, solutions in the education space. And I also want to thank you all for the work that you are doing to keep this issue at the forefront of Congress's agenda. Um, we couldn't do it without the on the ground perspective and advocacy that you all provide. So with that, happy to take any questions and always happy to be here and be a resource and partner to promote, to promote trauma-informed policy. Thank you so much, Ashley. Um, if anyone has any questions, feel free to put them in the chat or raise your hand. Um, but I can ask a quick one. Um, you know, I, I love the, I, the fact that you included a definition of trauma-informed practices because when it's not defined, um, it's not implemented well. So I think that's really fantastic. And, um, you know, I know that, um, you know, you all are building a coalition of support among Democrats and Republicans on and off the Hill with other organizations um, to support this bill and this proposal. And I'm wondering if you could speak to what that coalition building um, has looked like. Absolutely. Um, like I said, the trauma-informed schools work has been a big priority of my bosses here in Congress. And we're proud that the bill that we introduced back in June is actually, um, it's bipartisan here in the House. And we've also got a Senate partner that introduced it for the first time in the other chamber. So a lot of it is just um, getting other congressional partners on board, both being co-leads and co-sponsors of the bill. And it's my boss's bill is certainly a work product of a lot of input over the years um, from experts that know best about how trauma-informed practices should be defined and what that should look like in schools. So it's certainly um, an ongoing process to build up this strong coalition, but um, it's going well and we're excited for progress to be made on this issue this Congress. Thank you so much. Um, I see that Dion has a hand up. Dion, do you want to in, unmute yourself? Hi there, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thanks. Um, 
I'm sorry, I was trying to catch the funding sources. I got Title I and Title II, but could you repeat those for me? I wanted yes. to be able to jot those down. Yeah, Thank the you. bill includes Title I, Title II, the Student Support and Academic Achieve or Enrichment Grants, the SSAE funding, and the 21st Century Community Learning Center funding stream. Thank you. Yep. Great. And then Dennis, it looks like you have a question. You want to unmute yourself and ask it? Uh, yes. Um, do you have copies of what the actual clause says is the definition? Yeah, I'm definitely happy to um, link that bill for your, you all in the chat, if that makes sense. Yep, that's the bill too. Um, on the House side, it's HR 8494, and I've linked it there. And the definition will be spelled out there. Thank you, Ashley. The definition is very long, so we won't make you read it, but it's it's very long and <laughs> comprehensive with, yes. with many parts and bullet points. But, um, you know, we appreciate the opportunity to give some input on that as well. I know you you asked for a lot of impact, input when, when coming up with that definition. Yep, um, we started off the bill with as comprehensive of a definition as we can, just knowing that it is important to try and capture the nuances of um, trauma-informed practices, but always welcome to feedback as the bill makes its way through the process. Awesome. So we have time for one more quick question. Miriam, you have your hand up. Do you wanna unmute and ask your question? Sure, and if you would prefer not to answer this, I totally understand. Uh, I'm from Kentucky and I'm wondering if as you're building your coalition, you're seeing some geographic um, trends or tendencies and if there's anything that you would like to see advocated from certain parts of the country. Yeah, um, I guess no, um, nothing comes to mind when it comes to geographic trends, but I will say, um, we're always open to support um, from <laughs> members of Congress across the spectrum and across the country. I think something when it comes to student mental health, um, it's just one of those things that it's not an issue that discriminates <laughs> against red or blue states. It's schools across the country that are dealing with this. And it is something that we want to build a strong coalition from um, across the country. And I think when it comes to the advocacy side, um, just meeting with members of Congress on both sides of the aisle to inform about the need for this type of um, care and learning in the school environment is always very helpful. Great. Thank you so much, Ashley, uh, for your time and for answering those questions. We really appreciate it. Yeah. Um, again, I'll reiterate my thank you for all the work that you are doing here. And do you consider um, my, our office to be a partner with you all. And if there's anything more we can do to be helpful, please be in touch. Great. Thank, thank you, you Jen. Thank you all. Thanks. Um, well, Miriam's question really led in very well to um, our next uh, portion. So we're going to take a break at 2.45. But for the next five minutes, we wanted to provide an optional opportunity um, to engage in some advocacy um, and to promote um, both the report and uh, Catherine Clark's, Congresswoman Catherine Clark's bill. And so I think Jesse put in the chat the toolkit, um, but I'm also gonna share my screen once again. And um, this is correct. So we put together this toolkit um, for our advocates. And if you'd like, um, you know, we just gave an overview of the report here and then we have an email template. So if you'd like to reach out to your representative, about the report, you can say anything you'd like, but here's an example, you know, uh, right here, that's just very easy to copy paste. So I wanted to call your attention to this new resource and we link to the report. Um, it provides some details. We know that trauma-informed schools significantly decrease school suspension expulsion while increasing academic achievement, teacher retention and student graduation rates. Um, it just provides, you know, some benefits. This report will introduce you to the concept 
Um, and then it, it says several legislative proposals would help more schools across the country to transform into trauma-informed schools environment and gives the example of the bill that we just talked about to invest in um, professional development for teachers, after school programs and charter schools to provide school staff with training and resources they need. And I encourage you to co-sponsor this legislation. And if you'd like to include, you could uh, include a, a meeting request. So you can say, I'd like to meet with you or a member of your staff to discuss the report or answer questions and share additional advocacy um, and then to sign your name. And so if you're interested, let's take a couple of minutes and um, I can give you, you know, for those who maybe this might be your first time emailing your member of Congress, um, we have some instructions of, of exactly how to do that. And I can walk you through that now. Um, Jesse, can you give me a thumbs up if this is now on uh, the house.gov website? The yep. Okay, great. So the way to do that, you're gonna click on this link right here um, and it's gonna take you to a, a page, find your representative. If you don't know who represents you, this is where you wanna go. So my hometown rep, so I put my zip code for the, the place I grew up um, and my hometown rep is uh, Jim Himes. And so this link is really handy. It goes right to his, um, his we official website. Uh, but most of them are last name dot house dot gov. And this is for your your member on the House side. Everyone has one member of Congress on the House side and two senators. So this is on the House side. And then I'm just going to find where it says contact me. Sometimes you have to go to the menu. Sometimes it's right up there. And um, contact Jim. Scroll down where it says email me about legislation or, or an issue. And then right here, I would put in my name my street address. This is just so they can verify that you are a constituent and send you a reply email if he wants to um, you know, follow up with you. And then your email address, your phone number, then you can do a subject line, something um, education is the right topic for this one. And then you can just go through and copy and paste. So I'm just gonna copy this email here. And then I'm gonna paste it in this field here. And I'm gonna substitute out those, those fields. So hello. Congressman Himes, and then put this all in there, great. And then I'll, I'll offer a meeting request, and then I'll put my name. And then, um, you know, I would just submit it there. And then you do the same thing for your, um, your Senator. And so um, I would do, my Senator Chris Murphy, and I would do the same thing. I would find his contact page and I would put it right in there. And we can do this today on this topic, but if any topic that comes to mind, you can always, you can always write in. Um, and so we'll just give a, a, another minute or so. And I see we have a question from Miriam. I'm happy to answer. Sorry, again. Um, Quick question, are you guys gonna be tracking the progress of this bill through the process so that when there are opportune moments when we should really be alerting our uh, our representatives and senators to pay attention to it, we can then then send an email? I mean, I, I just, I think that sometimes even though I sign up to track legislation and things, it gets lost in my email. And so I'm, if I saw something from you, I might be more likely to pay attention to it. So I just didn't know if that was something that you had planned. Absolutely, yes. So we, if this bill gets a markup in committee, we'll let everyone know, which is a great time to pro provide support. And if it gets a vote on the floor, we'll let folks know. So that monthly newsletter that I was walking everyone through before, which we published on the CTIP website and on the PACES website, um, usually I give an update on all the bills we're tracking and what's happening in Congress. So that's a good place to look. Um, and you can also get our newsletters um, if you sign up uh, with the campaign. Um, Jesse just put in the chat. If you sign up, put your email, you'll get all those updates from us. Um, and this, this toolkit lives on the website. So if you don't want to do it today, but maybe later on, you can reference that as well. Um, and we are at 2.46, so I went one minute over. Um, but thank you so much for, uh, for listening, for learning, for participating. We're so grateful for your, your support and your um, attention. And I'll turn it over to Jesse. Thanks, Jen. And also just want to highlight that like it is very difficult to type live on screen. And you did a remarkable job there. I would have 
uh, spelled my name backwards, all that. If you have any more questions for Jen, we do have chat and choose with staff. Jen has a tremendous amount of knowledge and information. If they can be helpful, you can reach out, email, or set up a time to chat on this topic. Would strongly encourage folks to chat with Jen over myself. Um, but about anything that always stands, we have regular meetings, so don't hesitate to reach out to us via email or via chat and chew if we can be helpful. We have a wonderful, I, I know that we wanted to give a quick brain break if possible, but we have a wonderful second half of the call with um, Resilient Minds on the front lines with Kate Felice and Rob uh, Zepiel. Dr. Kate Felice is an education and psychology professor and coordinator of education programs at Rowan College of South Jersey. She began her career in law enforcement as a major crimes and narcotics detective and then transitioned into education with a proactive focus on kids' wellness. She trains in and incorporates trauma-informed mindfulness with nutrition, nature and movement for kids, veterans, and first responders to increase long-term resiliency and is a master resiliency trainer for the state of New Jersey and Georgia. And uh, Rob Zepiel is an attorney and the CEO of a nonprofit called Resilient Minds on the Front Lines, which we'll be hearing a lot more about uh, for the rest of this call. It's, um, it's based out of New Jersey and they conduct resiliency and wellness, sh chaplaincy, ACEs and handle with care, financial resiliency and leadership training nationwide. And so those were largely abbreviated uh, introductions because you can hear the rest from Kate and Rob themselves. Um, but Kate, Rob, thank you for being with us. I'll turn it over to you and just quickly share that as the presentation goes on, if you have questions, please put them in the chat. I'll keep a queue of questions and we'll get through as many of them as possible. But Kate and Rob, uh, I turn it over to you. Thank you so much uh, for doing that. I really appreciate your time and I appreciate that um, you forewent your break um, in order to spend this time with us. So thank you very much for that. Um, and um, I was gonna make you do a little brain break but I'll, I'll give you a pass on that because I'm sure everybody's doing those um, <laughs> on their own and in their classroom. But I will encourage you to just take a nice deep breath because I know I need one of those today. Um, and before I, uh, you know, um, pass off to Rob to explain a little bit more about Resilient Minds um, and our partnership here. I also just want to tell you, thank you for saying what I do um, and that bio. That's always my cringy part. But if I tell you um, who I am and the reason that I'm here, and I appreciate and honor that you did that um, earlier as well and shared, uh, Jesse, you know, I, the work that you are all doing is so important. And one of the reasons that we made this part of our mission is because there's so much great work being done um, and sometimes there's a siloed approach to that, you know, and how do we bring that together? And so having that background in um, law enforcement, which Rob does as well, and we'll tell you about in a sec when I zip it, um, and, and in education, for me, that made sense. And for a personal level, that made sense to me as a person, although I didn't realize it until much later in doing this work, that this work taps, taps into who we are as a person. Um, when I was a little girl, my dad, who was a police officer, was shot in the line of duty. He lived, um, but we carried a lot of, and he carried a lot of the invisible scars that came with that. And I didn't understand that because when, and I'm, I'm saying something that you all know, when we live in that space, we tend to make normal sometimes what could be perceived as abnormal to other people. We didn't talk about it much, but every once in a while, my dad would take a little piece out of his eye of a bullet fragment. And um, I didn't think that was as, as unique of an experience until I worked in this space and looked at the bigger picture that you don't see when you're a child of the impact that that had transgenerationally on our family and especially on doing this work. And I think that all of us probably share in our own personal story of why this work means so much. So for me, bringing together these entities that seem so logical to me, but often are doing great work, but not necessarily together was at the heart of this project. And so that's why I'm honored to share it with you because um, I think a lot of times there are people doing such amazing work, but the people who are making the decisions about it, especially in schools, because I do a lot of work in schools, aren't necessarily um, getting say in what that work is supposed to look like. It's more told, hey, you have to do this next thing, 
rather than how to do this thing, you know? So, and, and the thing is important and we all know that inherently. So we want to tell you something that we were able to do um, with Resilient Minds and also with the Burke Foundation that was more based on practical application with the people doing the work at the table saying, hey, what is this supposed to look like from your perspective? How do we really help the kids that you know and spend time with every single day? So with that, uh, Rob, I'll, I'll, I wanna give you opportunity. For <laughs> Thank you, Kate. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. First of all, if I sound like that I am underwater, I sound like I'm underwater to myself. Um, as Faye would have it at 155, right before we were about, to, I was about to jump on, I had one of those massive nosebleeds that just wouldn't stop. So. While you guys were talking, I was actually doing triage to myself, um, clean myself up as best I can, um, but uh, I guess showing uh, resiliency uh, uh, on the call. Um, so if I sound like I'm underwater, uh, I apologize. Um, so my name is Rob Sepio. I'm CEO of Resilient Minds on the Frontlines. We are a 501c3 nonprofit out of the state of New Jersey. Uh, my background is completely in law enforcement. I was a career prosecutor both at the county uh, and at the um, and at the state levels. I retired as a deputy director for the Division of Criminal Justice Office of the Attorney General. Um, easy way to understand my position. I was number three in the state on criminal justice issues in New Jersey. Um, had many different responsibilities, but the one which led me to this space in retirement um, was I was the first state chief resiliency officer for the state of New Jersey. And my job was to create a resiliency program, uh, policy procedures program, and, and train out 40,000 law enforcement officers in resiliency um, in the state of New Jersey within three years. Um, so we put it together. Um, I retired in June of 2021, gave myself a whole day off, and uh, we started Resilient Minds on the Front Lines the, the very next day. Um, the, first, uh, the first person that we approached in all of this was uh, Dr. Kate Tomati felice and she will show you in a minute why we approached her first. She also loves compliments, so if you want to give her compliments in the chat, please, by all means, do so. Um, but one of, one, of the, one, of, one of the leading experts and really takes in our program, in our resiliency program, which is a three-day program that we do, um, really takes... Um, really takes complex stuff when we're dealing with the neurosciences and makes it for, every, for everyone to understand. Uh, we also broaden out our curriculum. Um, so it's just not the first responder community that it applies to, it really applies to everyone. So we're currently doing trainings in the first responder community. We're doing training, we're training an entire school system up on the outskirts of Chicago. Um, we've trained nurses, we've trained grade school kids in this program. We've trained teachers um, in this program as well. Um, in taking care of and, and giving people tools to take care of themselves uh, on the resiliency end. On the ACEs uh, handle with care front, um, Kate and I have always had conversations and Kate um, is a master resiliency trainer for New Jersey and Georgia. Um, and when she took our program, um, there was a lot of crossover between what we taught in resiliency and what was being taught on the ACEs level and trauma informed level in the education world. Um, and there were two silos, as Kate talked about, that really didn't communicate much, and that's the law enforcement community and the education uh, community. And so through the, through the very generous donation by um, a grant that was given to Resilient Minds last year through the Burke Foundation, uh, what we wanted to do and what Kate, um, with, some, with other uh, experts in the area, uh, wanted to do was actually build a training specific um, to these both to both of these groups and and train both of these groups together. Um, and so that's what we did. Uh, we had three pilots that we did in the state of New Jersey. And with that, I'll turn it over to Kate and um, she's going to report out um, what our results were. Awesome. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to show you a PowerPoint because looking at my big head is probably plenty enough. Um, can everyone see that? Good, good, thank you, Jesse. Um, okay, so I figured it was something, I'm a visual learner, so sometimes it helps to be able to see something. And since Rob said neuroscience, I'm gonna show you my favorite trick for um, how we teach neuroscience when we're uh, with our students. So if you've done this before, bear with me, cross your arms the way that's comfortable. Okay, now try and cross them the other way. Does it feel kind of weird? <laughs> 
And so we have these patterns, right? And we have these ways of doing things that we become set in. And sometimes those things are the foundation of things that work really well. And sometimes those are things that we have to change a little bit and look at in a new way. Again, the beauty part of me being a teacher and working in a group like this is that I'm speaking to people who are already experts in this. So just to tell you a little bit about this program, what we wanted to do is bring to the table the law enforcement officers and the educators. In New Jersey, Handle With Care came forth, and Rob can speak to this as well, as a mandate. You need to do this in your schools. And so um, that, in theory, like many things, sounds really good, but what is that actually supposed to look like? So what we were trying to do is collect best practices from the voices of the people doing the work. So Burke Foundation was um, instrumental in saying, okay, go do that, see what that looks like. And you know, what are your objectives for trying to do this? Um, you can see we had a whole lot of goals. <laughs> so there's a lot to read on that slide. Um, and you don't certainly don't feel like obligated to read all of that, but ultimately, the goal is the same as the passion and mission that we're all here for. How do we make sure that these initiatives, that these efforts actually help kids and families? How do we bring together great work that's being done, increase awareness, move to being informed, and help people who need this information and build community around it? And we found at the pilot locations, we, throw, we chose three different locations in New Jersey. Um, and if you're familiar with New Jersey, it's vastly different depending upon where you are, like anywhere, um, in North, Central, and in South Jersey. And so um, we wanted communities that had differences so that we could look at what, does it, what are they already doing? What do they have in place that's working? How do they implement this policy handle with care, which is supposed to be, and forgive me if you already know and I'm being redundant, a notification system from law enforcement. When there's an activity that happens at the home, how do we make sure, or, or in the community, I should say. So I'll show you what those um, notifications are made for in just a moment. Um, how do we then bring that information to the school so that they're aware that there's some kind of communication that something happened and that there can be more communication to say, you know, how do we best support this child? So we wanted to figure out what are you already doing? Are you doing anything? Is it working? And how can we learn from best practices so that other places can learn from that as well? So there was a huge variety in what people were doing. We did um, workshops with, and this was kind of key to what we were doing, we took a workshop and we said, let's bring the people doing the work, the people in the school, not necessarily decision makers, although some came to the table, which is always important. But, um, and I use that term intentionally because having been uh, a classroom teacher, you're not always a decision maker. <laughs> so sometimes you're the person receiving the decisions. And we brought uh, law enforcement officers, we brought teachers, we brought some, uh, if whoever else they deemed as part of this team to talk about what, what should this look like. In some places, if they had a school psychologist, that person came or social worker. Um, in one case, a principal came. And people from the law enforcement community, the school resource officer, um, whomever was in charge of collecting that information so that they could come together. The purpose was twofold. It wasn't just to improve that communication. It was also to build a bridge between people who were doing great work around kids but could benefit from the communication. It was also to help those helpers and make sure that they were taking care of themselves because we all know that there's compassion fatigue, there's vicarious trauma, there's a lot of things that we carry when we're working in this space. So how can we use and, and be more aware and what does that look like? So there was a lot that we went into this with objectives. I also wanted to show you the original, um, I won't make you watch the videos, but the original directive that came down from the um, Attorney General's office. So what was supposed to happen is here in terms of the handle with care notice. And I'll show you under what events that the notice was supposed to be made. But also as much as it's a mandate, it was also a movement toward this information is important came at a similar time as the resiliency initiative and the ACEs awareness piece in school that Burke was instrumental in making sure, how do we do this as a community? How do we become more 
aware of what our kids are going through, what our community is going through, and how do we have a better community approach? So I'm not going to show the videos because I'm not sure if you'll hear my sounds, but I did um, want to show you this. So this is a version of one county's form of what the handle with care notification would, would be uh, would be generated because of. Now this, I know you're going to look at this and you're going to say, well, that's not inclusive. A child could be traumatized by many other things. Um, the initial notification would be made by these and by anything else deemed, you know, this is something that could be potentially traumatic to a child. And so it would be helpful if the law enforcement officers who, you know, received that call or worked with that family could notify the school and, you know, be, help increase that awareness. The teacher wouldn't know which of these happened. They wouldn't have all of that information, but they would be able to know something happened, handle this child with care. And then further the policy in terms of what they felt would be the right course of action, use their expertise, use what they already had in place. Um, so, you know, and, and this is came in, coming, I should say, from the state in terms of what those notifications would happen. Um, this is from the Burke Foundation in terms of looking at the two populations we talked about, law enforcement and teachers. They gathered these statistics interviewing those people and saying, hey, how much do you know about ACEs? Um, and, you know, what, what more do you, you know, what do you know right now? Where's your current about, you know, amount of knowledge? And, you know, how much is that necessary for your work? So going back to, um, you know, that information, sometimes working in this space, and I think Jen said this, we, we assume that other people are aware of or know about this, but also become giving that information to help people feel empowered was really important um, as part of that. So it was kind of a baseline place to start and say, what else do people need to know? Um, and we talked about some of what they already have in their school, in their department. Um, do they need increased training? Um, what is it that they're doing? A lot of the people who were in the room had a, a good awareness or strong awareness and felt pretty competent, but they said, hey, listen, this needs to be a change. And I'm sure you've all, when you work with different agencies, when they say, I wish everybody had this training. I wish everybody knew more about this because we know it inherently in our practice, but the more information that's out there, the more we can help our community. And I do wanna point out a couple of things from the um, pilot program that were really humbling and powerful. Um, we asked, you know, what is your own personal experience of the people who were um, involved? You know, what, and, and not, not asking them necessarily what they had, you know, their, what they didn't wanna share, but asking them, What's, what is working? What do you see that is effective? Where do you need help? What do you wish the other side, if you will, the other group knew? You know, do you, what would be helpful for them to know about what you do in your professional practice that would be, make things more efficient, more effective? You know, what, what could we share information wise? Um, what are we both seeing with? you know, that's going on in our communities that there might be resources available. One of the things that happened that was really interesting is when they all sat at the table, they discussed some of the resources that were available. And literally it was a light bulb moment because some were saying, oh, oh, great, we can use that. Families, that can benefit our families. I didn't know we had something that could help with food insecurity. Let's let them know. And one of our pilot lo locations actually sat down together and compiled a resource list that they wanted to share with their families and say, you know, hey, here's some things you might not know exist, but we want to help you and build that out. It was really useful too, because then they could see their law enforcement officers in a bit of a different light. You know, that this is an, an ally in helping our kids and to see them differently and, and in a different role um, that is a shared role. And so it was really, I'm sure some of you have seen this before, but um, how do we, use that information for ourselves, but also for the kids that we're working with. And how do we extend that out to the community? How do we make sure we're taking care of ourselves and we're also taking care of the people we're working with? And lots of words, but um, when we talked about resilience as well, that was important for us to take care of the people who were in the model, in the workshop and say, how do we make sure that 
you know, you're not being stuck in this space, um, that you can, you know, that you're growing from this, that you're able to uh, feel empowered in helping other people. So we talked about that in that space as well. The workshop was really interactive and people were able to have conversations that you might not have the opportunity to have with those people at the table. And ultimately, um, what was really, uh, I think, hopeful um, for us was that we were there for the same mission and purpose. We want to help people. We want to help kids. And how do we do that better together? Um, and so we talked about some of the things that help you know, how, and, and it looked different from each of the locations. What are some of the things that have helped me? Uh, what are some of the things that have been challenges? We, uh, what can we do um, to support growth and resilience? It looked very different from place to place. Some places were very much focused on, you know, how do we make sure the information is received and goes to the right people? How do we make sure that in our efforts to help kids, we're not re-traumatizing them? How do we make the rest of our school population and our community more aware of ACEs, of trauma, of, you know, however, whatever information that they needed. As I mentioned, one of the locations came up with um, a resource list that they wanted to curate together. Uh, another location said, hey, we want there to be a positive interaction with kids so that, you know, well, how can we make sure we're not just having this notification when something's wrong, but that we can build on building relationships sustainably with people that they might not have previously had a relationship with. So it opened the door for a lot of different conversations. As I mentioned, what would be helpful to know? Um, what do you wish, um, you know, what would make your job be more effective and how can we work together? So there was that opportunity as well to, to have a conversation that we might not previously have had the opportunity to do that. Um, often, it was in the form of school resource officers in partnership with the police department and who they had available or you know who they assigned to the position of being in the school or working with the school. But there was also a change, if you will, or a conversation about how do we make sure everybody's part of this conversation? What else can we do you know, together as a group to be more resilient and to um, change the awareness and the knowledge? Um, some of the things they came up with um, that, you know, what strategies can we use? We tried to answer these questions. How do we better communicate? Um, how do we use information and make sure things are data driven? And, and, we're, and, and when I use that word, I use it uh, with an asterisk because it's not just about data. It's about making sure that our initiatives are reaching the people that they're intended for. How do we make sure that this isn't just one more, you know, intervention, but recognizing that every single interaction is an intervention. And how do we use that and allow these people the space to be able to do that? Because that builds their resilience as well. And I, and I think that was really a humbling part of it um, to be able to see people say, I, this is why I got into this. And this is what I wanted the opportunity to do. So um, lots of words there, but it kind of breaks down and I'll hover there for a moment. The, some of the responses, um, we really had some positive response from that in terms of they were glad to be at the table together. Um, it was empowering in the sense that they got to decide what should this policy look like in real time? How do we do this, you know, and how do we do this together so that it actually indicates or, or ends up with a result that is going to affect and change people and help kids. Um, they also, as you can see, wanted more, um, more training, more working together, um, get the rest of the school involved. And we left also on a place of how do we involve the greater community? How do we make sure families are involved? Um, and they had some really great ideas and Burke facilitated, uh, the Burke Foundation facilitated doing a community event and each pilot got to decide, pilot location got to decide, how do we do that? How do we bring our community here to see these people um, even more so as allies? Some people see their teachers, some people see law enforcement, some people see both or neither. And how do we build that so that they realize that there's support there? So I've given you a bunch of information um, and I realize there's probably some, some questions there. Um, and I want to, uh, to pause there and Rob, if you want to add anything, um, please, please do. 
No, I, I think you you summed it up well, Kate, with regards to what we what we wanted to do. Um, there were some questions with regards to buy-in from law enforcement, um, both with the handle with care policy and creation of the handle with care policy, um, resiliency generally, and and you know buy-in with law enforcement in uh, with this program. Uh, and the answer is we had complete buy-in with law enforcement, um, both on a statewide level with the resiliency program, because really it's a training to help them individually. Um, there was buy-in with the handle with care policy um, as well, because we uh, we actually brought in all the stakeholders in creating the policy. Um, so it, this wasn't just the attorney general's office um, writing policy in a vacuum, we brought in all the stakeholders, including the State Chiefs Association and the County Prosecutors Association, uh, the School Resource Officer Association, um, unions were involved in it, uh, Department of Education uh, with the Handle with Care policy was brought in, um, and their stakeholders as well. Um, so we, we, we kind of brought everybody in, in, and the way in which we wrote policy was best idea wins, so there was robust conversations as to um, as to what could be done and couldn't be done, um, you know, we one of the one of the big debates when in creation of the handle with care policy was the actual right to privacy and how much should be disclosed, um, especially in dealing with uh, dealing with a traumatic event. Um, and so there was robust conversation about that, and we landed with the list that Kate showed you um, in that process. Um, the big thing here that um, uh, and when and when Kate first pitched this idea uh, to me uh, um, over a, a, a lunch um, was the fact that this model actually, instead of going from the state down, which is where I normally was, where you when you write policy, it's very general and you try to capture as much as you can here. Um, this this pilot and this training actually went from the bottom up. So it was very localized um, and also allowed them within the confines of the policy uh, to uh, to come up with their own processes and procedures and who should be contacted as Kate indicated and who didn't. Uh, and they had a lot of great ideas, uh, a lot of great ideas actually that um, in, in all three as to how to streamline certain things. And in some instances, I think you would agree with me, Kate, make the policy better and ease and much more and, and easier to uh, to deal with. And then the de, uh, demystifying um, potential issues, right? I mean, the education people sometimes were a little frustrated about the lack of uh, the lack of things that law enforcement provided, other than a general notification and the understanding why and having that communication. Um, I think Kate, one of the one of the one of the things from one of the pilots was actually uh, coming up with uh, uh, points of contact on both sides. Right. So should there be a family in crisis, uh, you know, actually giving um, on the law enforcement side, if the contact is law enforcement, giving school information, uh, educators and from the educator giving, you know, uh, potential law enforcement and, and outside um, um, uh, resources that are, were available that uh, I think some in the room didn't even didn't realize how many local resources were available for families. You want to talk about that a little bit, Kate? Definitely, yeah. So um, it, it was really interesting to see not only the cultivation of resources, but the ability to have a point of contact, a person that you could get in touch with, because not only was the information by necessity, by mandate coming from the handle with care notice, but a lot of the educators were saying, hey, listen, we have information too that these kids tell us in the classroom that would probably be helpful you know, in a cross, <laughs> so that we have ongoing communication, something that can help the family, something that might be, you know, necessary for both parties to be aware of, to have a more, um, a better understanding and be able to better support the child. So that point of contact was really useful and important, as well as other resources. One of them said, you know, hey, we give families a card. One of the police officers said, we give the families a card right at the scene of different things they can call, you know, contacts if they need something right now. We could add you guys to that. It was so simple. You know, we could add who should they talk to if they're having a little bit of trouble at school tomorrow. Who would be the best point of contact? Such a simple solution. Another one that they came up with that the policy didn't necessarily cover, practical application always looks a little different, is you know, what happens if a kid lives at you know, one grown-up's house um, 
you know, during the week in a different grown-up's house on different days, how do we, if something happens at one house, how do we make sure it gets to, you know, the information at the school so that that child can be helped? Or what if they live out of district? And we literally went, huh, that's a really good point. <laughs> Let's figure out how to handle that. So it was coming from the people who were going to have to handle that problem or that, you know, concern like, oh, wow, what is this going to do? Why, why make it harder on them by telling them what they should do? Tell us what would make sense for you to be able to do your job effectively, and that's going to become the procedure. So it really was important to us to have the people, you know, I kind of gave you the, the 30,000 foot view of what it did for them, but also on a really practical level, it troubled, it hit a lot of things that could have been troubling and empowered them to say, hey, this really works. It was only, you know, when you consider three pilots, we have been contacted by many places since saying, hey, what did they do? <laughs> and how can we use that? Because it has to look different for each place. And, you know, it, it's, it's a lot of great lessons learned from the people doing the work. I'll pause there too for questions. Thanks, Kate. Uh, there, there are questions piling up. Uh, one quick one before I forget. Is there a copy of the policy or the legislation that was passed at the state level, Rob, that you talked about? Would you be able to just put that in the chat? Um, at some point, curious to see if that's something that can be replicated, but also appreciate the process. And Kate, to what you just said, the fact that this shouldn't be replicated immediately in other states because it depends on the population's resources and needs, right? But to see that could be a helpful, um, helpful piece. I know that we just acknowledged, I believe, Dennis's first question and, and one of Deb's questions. Um, Kate, at one point you talked about sort of how we need to do both self-care and community care. And I'm curious if you can talk about the intersection between the two and how sometimes that outreach can be healing at the individual level as well and how like, you know, doing both at the same time can actually be supportive of sort of this virtuous cycle, if you will, for yourself and others. Absolutely. Um, I I started to call that reciprocal resiliency based on my own experiences in, um, you know, I think a lot of times as helpers, we know what it feels like to have not had help at critical moments. So when we have the opportunity to be that person who can offer that, um, just speaking frankly from the people who were in the room, and I fortunately get to spend a lot of time with both with all different helpers, but with a lot of law enforcement, a lot of teachers, if you ask them why they got into the job in the first place, they wanted to help. And sometimes that gets lost along the way, the feeling that our efforts are actually making a difference to help the people that we came into this space to help in the first place. So it was really, um, I think there's an opportunity there for it to be empowering to say, here's the direct result of some of the efforts that you're doing. Here's how you can shape that because you know you have this wisdom and experience. We don't need to reinvent that. Let's use that. But at the same time, when you have voice in that, you you can see the direct results of your effort, which I think makes you feel like you're doing something that has substance and sustainability rather than spinning your wheels. And we've all been on teams that do both of those things. So I think that the opportunity, well, two things. One, to realize that we know what it feels like to need help and to make sure we're taking care of ourselves in that, which is hard sometimes in this space. You know, they, it reminds me of when they say, when you get in the airplane, you have to put on the oxygen before you can help the people next to you. And I'm always looking at my two kids going, nah, I'll just go <gasps> and to make sure they're okay before I take care of me. But my, my uh, logical self knows that I, I have to take care of myself to be able to continue to take care of other people. I think that programs like this is, is serve as a reminder, especially because you get to see, okay, I'm not just the bearer of bad news. And sometimes we feel like that as educators and as law enforcement, you know, when, when do you get a call home from school? When, do you, when does law enforcement come? It's usually when something's wrong. And this gave them the opportunity to be a part of, yes, it's, it can be heavy and to watch a child go through something and a family go through something, but there's also healing in that, that you can see we're helping them. We're pointing them in the direction of resources. The goal is never to re-traumatize and be like, hey, are you okay to the child? But to, to find supports for that child, to circle back later and maybe see, you know, is there something else I can do to build relationships that are going to serve as support going forward and to be a part of that relationship? 
is is really empowering and I think helps with that. Jesse, to your point. Yeah, no, that's great, Kate. Thank you. Um, I, I love the term reciprocal resiliency. I will start to incorporate that. I'll, I'll, I'll give you credit every time, I promise. <laughs> I'll take it. Thanks. <laughs> um, so, uh, Rob, I see that you just answered Dennis in the chat, but Dennis asked, do the departments have juvenile officers and how were they involved? I saw that you gave an answer, but don't know if you just want to expand for others in the audience that may not have read the chat. Uh, sure. So, uh, Dennis, I assume it's with handle with care and, and resiliency that we're talking about. The answer to, to both of those is yes. In New Jersey, we have juvenile officers. Uh, we have at the county level, we have juvenile units that uh, deal specifically with juvenile adjudications and delinquency. Uh, we have school resource officers and we have SLEO 3s. SLEO 3s are retired law enforcement officers that um, have law enforcement authority in the schools. The SLEO 3s generally do more of security type thing dealing with potential active shooter than uh, than actual SRO. Um, so those are those are the three groups that deal with on the on the on the law enforcement side to deal with juveniles. Uh, and the answer to the question is, yeah, they, they had they had a seat at the table in creation of the policy uh, and the policies. Our general rule was to get as many stakeholders as we could in the room. Uh, in creation policy, so there was robust discussion. Um, so uh, when we when when the policy was done uh, and created, uh, we didn't have to do many edits as we implemented. But so yes, they they were they were involved in the process. Thanks, Rob. Um, and then from Deb, are children aware that their schools would be notified? I'll expand that to the families as well. I love that question. And that question came up a lot. And I'll be honest with you, it was something that we had to um, illuminate and shine a little bit of light on because initially it was, you know, kind of, hey, this makes sense. We let these families know they get support. Everybody's on the same team. Everybody's on the same page. And, and a lot of people rightly so brought up the point, hey, what if I don't want the notification to happen? What if I'm afraid of how that looks. What if I think, oh my gosh, my teacher knows this thing, or you know, my the teacher knows this thing that is happening in my home that I don't want them to know. Um, I'd like to say, hey, let me advance the slide, and here's the easy answer to that question. It's not an easy answer, right? So that was part of the conversation to say, what do we do when this notification is mandated? It is supposed to happen to build a culture around making people not fear that there's some kind of stigma that's going to come from that awareness. And again, I can't tell you what that's supposed to, I can give suggestions, but I certainly can't say in each community what that needed to look like. But I will say that across the board, it had to do with building relationships and taking away you know, that hesitancy, what is that gonna look like? Do I have the perfect answer? Nope, not selling you toxic positivity here and saying, and we fixed it and everyone's happy about knowing this information. No, there are some barriers to sharing that information and some fear about that and that, adds a task of, okay, what do I do with, I'm supposed to let people know this, and that could make them very uncomfortable. And I'll get one of our pilot locations spoke a lot about that and said, hey, this isn't the only place we run into this. You know, if there is a DCPMP call, some people are really hesitant about that. Or if, you know, there's the kid, the child goes to the nurse and tells them, discloses something it really gave a robust conversation about what do we do when it's in their best interest to share information, but they're also really hesitant to share that information. And that's very personal too, because we've all been in those places. So it opened up conversation. I will say in that place, they came up with some, some great solutions that I can share if anybody's specifically interested, but it still is a conversation that I saw the question, um, what support pieces are missing? That is one of them. How do we build that culture around making people not feel afraid of what happens when that information is shared? That's one of the things. Rob, I see you're unmuted, so I don't want to talk over. No, it's, um, I'm looking up the, 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 the policy, the directive number for Handle with Care while you're talking, so I know you're good. Okay. Um, yeah, so I think that that would be one of the things that people doing the work came up with as a missing piece. How do we do that? How do we make sure that happens? Um, I also think that, um, you know, it was discussed of how do we also build in some positive supports so it doesn't always feel reactive. You know, like, oh, we have to do this thing, now what? You know, instead, how can we build in positive, you know, so that it's not, um, I just got a call from the school or from law enforcement because something is wrong. How do we 
build in something when something is right. And one of our pilots actually came up with that. They said, listen, can we build something around like the kids having lunch with the officer that's in their school, the officers and teachers having lunch so that they see these people work together. They're not people over there that I have to be afraid of. Because to be perfectly honest, in some communities, they're very afraid of some of the people who were sitting at that table because of a lot of reasons that, you know, how do we build that relationship? So that there are plenty of missing pieces, but I put that with the fact that the pieces need to be put by the people doing the work in the community. You know what I mean? And they were able to say, oh, we're having trouble because these kids live out of district. You know, the state shouldn't be telling you how to solve that problem. That's something that is, is makes sense to the people doing the work. So how can we support them in doing that and give them what they need to make sure that they can be autonomous and effective? That's great, thank you. Um, I, I realize that we're short on time. I think that we've got two or three more questions if that's all right. I, I recognize as folks need to hop off for 3.30s, that's okay. Again, we have the recording. Uh, for those that are able to stay, please do. Kate and Rob, if you're not able to stay past 3.30, please let me know. Um, so there is generally a problem in the trauma-informed movement that we sometimes run into or with any training or new program where it's like, this is just one more thing. We can't manage one more thing. And so curious how you've sort of circumvented, obviously having policy that mandates something is helpful, but even in the frustration that can come from that sort of those conversations, how you've worked through that. And if people have found that it actually, as it rolls out, has alleviated any burden um, in other parts of their job to free up space? Right. That's such a great question. And as someone in education, it does always feel like somebody else is handing you one more thing to, and I think that's in both professions. I mean, there's a lot of standard operating procedures and they come down. And that's why it was so important to us to make sure that the people who are actually going to be doing this thing got to say how this thing should be done so that it was more effective in their work. Um, but we literally walked in and started with that. Yes, we know this is one more thing. Yes, we know it's a mandate and there's plenty of mandates and you're probably thinking, here we go again. How do we make this one work? And that's why talking about their own experiences in terms of you know, what kind of the cases that you're seeing, the kids that you're seeing, we wanna figure out how to best help and we need your help to do that. And that's the beautiful thing about helpers when you ask for their help, we're always right there in it. And they really did come up with things that were useful for plenty of other places too. Um, so I think that that is part of it is when people feel like they have a say in something that they're being told to do, they can make sure it's done more effectively. And then it doesn't, yeah, it's still one more thing to do. I can't take that piece away, but at least the thing you're doing is yielding something that aligns with theoretically why they passed it down to you in the first place. Yeah, and, and Jesse, we, from our end, we first activated law enforcement contacts. Um, one, one person on our team that's not on this call is Chief Lusner. Um, he's a champion of ACES uh, training for law enforcement. He was, the, uh, he was the president of the State Chiefs Association. So once, once we started to talk to them, we reached out to the, to the chiefs, um, asked for volunteers, uh, went to the State Chiefs Association, at a number of jurisdictions from the chief side volunteer. And then we kind of leveraged those relationships with the chief reaching out right to the principal and the superintendent on the education side and talk about how important this is. Um, and, and then with Dr. Kate's contacts on the education side, following up and, and, and really getting people on board. Um, I have to say that um, for the second, we did the first pilot. Um, and this was, by the way, we pushed this out with a COVID spike uh, last year. Uh, and uh, and so we had all kinds of challenges, but even then between the first and second pilot, we actually had jurisdiction saying, okay, when are you coming back? Um, so once they got the training, once they were in the room and, and experienced what happened, um, they they basically wanted to finish it out. It wasn't a situation where we we were we were trying to you know schedule these people. They were they were willing participants. All three jurisdictions were great on that end. Yeah, that's great to hear. Um, does handle with care work better with a community policing model? Have you seen um, that sort of relationship evolve to be able to answer that question yet? 
Um, so I think handle with care is 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 based upon that community policing um, uh, policing reform um, that we see. It's just it's just another piece. It's designed to make sure that no child gets left behind um, in dealing with interaction with law enforcement. Um, so I, I would say that yeah, this this is one more piece of the community police on the law enforcement side. Um, that would constitute traditional community policing um, that you see leveraging. Another is outreach, um, you know, and 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 doing in New Jersey, we have a robust outreach program um, with with all the stakeholders within the separate communities as well, and 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 dealing with that. Gotcha. And then the last question that I saw that it says police and libraries. Uh, I may have forgotten some context since that was put in the chat. Um, but if there's an answer to that, do you have police and libraries? If that's something that you said, sort of what's the structure of that? It sounds like it's related to the outreach piece. Yeah, so in in libraries, public libraries, no. But if there's a library within the school, then obviously that's within the jurisdiction of the of the SRO. So no police that that I'm aware of actually assigned to a school unless it's some sort of proactive, issue where we're having things or library sorry proactive issues at the library where maybe they're, they're having patrols there um but not not that i'm aware of no gotcha and dennis i see your hand up and that was your question so yeah, go ahead what it was was you know, we're having uh various lgbtqia people in libraries reading with the kids and it just occurred to me that you could do the same thing with police officers in the libraries, not to negate one, but to do both. And so that the kids would um, start, see, you know, maybe the retirees could do this pretty well. Just go in and read stories to the kids in the public libraries or in the bookstores. Just an idea. I love that, Dennis. And we do have, um, it's really been innovative. Again, we didn't prescribe what people should do. We leaned on the expertise of the people doing it. But we do have um, officers who have been, you know, had have, have done lunch. Some have worked out in the fitness center with kids to, you know, like, hey, let's go after school or let's go during this, whatever, to be in the school community. Um, reading to the kids is awesome. Uh, one of the schools that we work in has a school dog. And so the, the kids get to interact there. They follow the dog on Instagram. That's my actual <laughs> campus that we have uh, this school dog. So it's really cool to see how people have been innovative in terms of what that looks like. And one of the things we encouraged was, hey, let's, let's let the kids see you working together. So at one of our locations, they had a community day where uh, the officers and the teachers together manned a table and gave out water bottles and, and things like that. At another, um, they uh, came in, you know, they did a 5K together, you know, and, and they did this, it was to raise money for the school, that kind of thing. So I think that your idea is amazing. And I think there's no end to the innovation that can happen to help kids when you ask the people doing the work, how do we do this best? in your own community and how do we change culture? And that's where you get the buy-in. By the way, nobody we asked to be a part of this said no. They all wanted to be part of it. And the buy-in from the community comes from the people you trust, seeing that they're doing this work. You know, I might not trust that officer, but when my teacher's standing with that officer and I trust my teacher, maybe I do or vice versa. So it's, it's showing by doing rather than telling you this will be helpful. Yeah. Thank you, Kate. That 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 seems like a wonderful place to wrap up. Is there anything else that either of you want to share in closing for such a wonderful presentation? It's okay if not. Oh, I think you I think you just saw why Kate was one of our first contacts at Resilient Minds <laughs> in the front lines. Um, no, it's just uh, it's just an honor to uh, to be invited, Jesse. And thank you for what all of you do on this call. And uh, thank you for the invite on behalf of Resilient Minds in the front lines. Hey. Absolutely. Thank you so much. And we're humbled and honored. And if there's anything that our work can, you know, innovation's key, right, in this space. So if there's anything that we can do that can help support or lift what you do, we're all in. We'll stay in touch. And same here. Really appreciate you all, Kate. We know how much you love compliments. So thank <laughs> you again for such a wonderful job, Rob. My signal is funny. I can't hear no. you. <laughs> <laughs> Rob, couldn't tell that you had 
anything come up ahead of time, but certainly appreciate the modeling resiliency on all fronts. Just want to share really quickly before Dave Ellis, uh, former executive director from the Office of Resilience in the great state of New Jersey, uh, hopped off earlier. He had to go, but um, the Office of Resilience is having a people's gathering tomorrow. And I just put the Eventbrite link in the chat. He said, if anybody wants to join, y'all are welcome. But again, Jen and Ashley, thank you for the policy updates and the education report updates on the front end. Kate and Rob, thank you so much for an informative and wonderful presentation. We look forward to continuing to work with you. It's going to take all of us to keep moving the needle forward. So just looking forward to keeping all this momentum going. Hope you all have a wonderful rest of your day, week, month. Stay healthy and well. Talk to you soon.